Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Mina Rose. I'm the project coordinator for the CWC Coalition. And um, today we are really lucky to have a great panel for you with a really important and timely topic. Um, so today we will be talking about um, current issues in CWC compliance. Um, I'm going to just give a brief introduction, um, and then I will introduce our uh, panelists, and then just in the interest of time, I'll keep it very brief and we can um, move straight to the, um, the panel discussion. So um, for those of you who may not know, um, the CWC reached a, a historic uh, milestone in its history last year um, with the verified destruction of all declared chemical weapons stockpiles. Um, although we can and should and have been celebrating this achievement, we shouldn't consider the work of the OPCW in enforcing the CWC over. At this point, um, one of the core tenets of the CWC is preventing re-emergence of chemical weapons. And this has been challenged in recent years in a few cases, notably by documented chemical attacks in Syria, and more recently by accusations um, by Ukraine that Russia has been using riot control agents uh, on the battlefield. So today we'll look at ways we can address these challenges in compliance with the CWC. Um, we have three uh, amazing panelists, as I said. The first is uh, Ambassador Ahmed Uzumchu, who is the former Director General of the OPCW. Um, he will give a presentation for about um, 10 minutes, walk us through the history of the OPCW investigations in Syria and the role that the OPCW can um, has been playing in assessing alleged chemical attacks by member states. And then uh, our second speaker, Fadal Abdul Ghani, is the head of the Syrian Network for Human Rights. He'll be able to talk us talk to us about the um, role of civil society in helping with these investigations and in documenting chemical attacks. And then finally, we're joined by Ambassador Susanna Gordon, the um, ambassador from New Zealand to the Netherlands. And um, she will be talking about the role that member states um, can play in addressing compliance and, and talk more about the case um, of Ukraine. So without further ado, uh, I just want to briefly outline um, what will happen after the three panelists um, will speak, and then um, we'll have time for about a 30-minute Q&A session with the audience. Um, please put your questions in the um, Q&A, not in the chat. I'll be checking, I'll go through, and um, I'll um, read your, your questions um, as time allows to our panelists, and they'll be able to answer. Um, so, Without further ado, we can um, move now to Ambassador Uzumchu. Um, so Ambassador, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mina. Um, when Ban Ki-moon, the UN Secretary General, called me at the end of March in 2013, I was at the airport in Vienna waiting for my flight back to Amsterdam. I already knew what the Secretary General was going to speak about. He said he decided to invoke the UN Secretary General mechanism, UNSG mechanism, to investigate an alleged chemical attack in Canal Assal near Aleppo in Syria. The request was made by the Syrian government based on the 1925 Geneva Convention. 13 Syrian soldiers were killed as a result of the attack. Ban Ki-moon asked me whether the OKSW would be able to support the investigation. My answer was affirmative. We were preparing our staff for such missions since the civil war began in March 2011 in Syria. We knew that Syria possessed large stocks of chemical weapons and they could be used during the war and the OPCW could be called upon for investigation. Our inspectors went through training programs for possible develop, uh, deployment in combat zones. I didn't need to consult with member countries before I responded to the Secretary General since there was a relationship agreement between the UN and OPCW dating back 2011, which tasked the latter to provide the necessary support for the UNSGM to investigate alleged uses of chemical weapons in countries which are not parties to the Chemical Weapons Convention, CWC. I informed the state's parties delegations about the upcoming mission upon my return to the aid. The OPCW 
pr provided nine inspectors, all volunteers, and the WHO three experts. Oke Sestrom, a Swedish scientist, was appointed as the head of the mission by the UN. They were ready to travel to Syria from The Hague as of late April, but there was no green light from Damascus. Following the Syrian submission, France and the United Kingdom requested separately that two other reports the incidents be investigated by the same mission. Secretary General accepted these requests, but the Syrians did not. They dragged their feet for months. And uh, uh, finally, uh, Angela Kane, the UN High Representative for Disarmament, traveled to Damascus and she was able to convince the Syrian officials to receive the mission. The team arrived in Damascus in August 2013. While the team led by Dr. Sestrom was preparing to go to the incident site as planned, a new chemical attack occurred on 21st August in Ghouta near Damascus. The Secretary General instructed the team to investigate this incident first. In spite of a sniper attack at the buffer zone and the loss of an armored vehicle, the team was able to reach Ghouta in a second attempt and collect the environmental and biomedical samples. The OPSW procedures were followed. The samples were split at the OPSW lab in The Hague and sent to two designated labs in member countries. The analysis, which corroborated, corroborated each other, proved the use of sarin, a nerve agent. More than 1,400 people lost their lives in Ghouta in a few hours on that day. The Syrian government denied any responsibility and the UNSG mechanism didn't go into attribution. After the Sarin attack in Ghouta, we were holding our breath for a possible military operation against the Syrian regime held responsible for the use of chemical weapons by the United States and some other Western countries. The red line declared by President Obama was crossed. While preparations for such an attack were underway, Russia made a proposal. The US and Russian delegations negotiated a framework document in Geneva, according to which the Syrian government would accept the elimination of its chemical weapons program under international verification and join the OPSW as a member. This document became the basis of the decision adopted by the OPSW Executive Council on 27 September 2013 and the UN Security Council Resolution 2118 endorsing it, adopted on the same day in New York. As to the planning and implementation of the decisions, Ban Ki-moon and I agreed to establish an OPSW and joint mission. We jointly appointed a, a special coordinator who would report to both of us. The OPSW UN joint mission was strongly supported by the OPSW membership. The engagement by member states, the professionalism of the OPSW staff, as well as the UN support, made the joint mission in Syria a tremendous success. In less than a year, all declared chemical weapons and production facilities were destroyed under the verification of the OPSW. However, gaps, inconsistencies, and discrepancies continue to exist on the Syrian declaration. The efforts by the OPSW's declaration assessment team, that, and two rounds of consultations in The Hague between the OPSW delegation that I led and the Syrian delegation headed by Faisal Mekdad the current foreign minister of Syria produced limited progress. Based on the findings of that, myself and later my successor reports on several occasions that the Syrian declaration was not complete and accurate. This situation has not changed since then. That uh, apparently resumed its consultations with the Syrian officials last, of, uh, last year in October, and another round of uh, discussions took place at the end of January this year. In Damascus. The allegations of use of chemical weapons in Syria continued after it had become a member of the OPSW. We could not remain indifferent to such reports. Normally, the challenge inspection mechanism should have been invoked, but no member country was willing to do it. As Director General, I had no authority to activate the mechanism. Following consultations with some states parties in spring 2014, I decided to develop a new mechanism in order to establish the facts surrounding the allegations of use. We called it the fact finder mission, FFM in short. We drafted a terms of reference that we shared with Syria and they approved it. The Syrian authorities initially dragged their feet before giving access to the OPSW team in May. We put in May 2014. We, we, we put a fair, fair firewall between the joint mission dealing with the elimination of the Syrian chemical weapons program and the FFM upon the request of the UN. 
while the FFM team was preparing in Damascus to go to the site of uh, is an incident, a new chemical attack was reported in Kafrizita, north of Amman. On 27 May, early in the morning, the FFM team on its way into Kafrizita came under attack at the buffer zone between the government-held territory and the opposition-controlled area. An armored vehicle was destroyed by a remotely, remotely exploded roadside bomb, and this was followed by an ambush. Fortunately, the team members survived the attack with minor injuries. Both the government and the opposition groups denied any responsibility. I had to go back them, uh, the team to The Hague. There were two options, to suspend the investigations or to pursue them from outside the Syrian territory. We chose the latter. We deployed the FFM to neighboring countries, to Syria, from where they had the possibility to contact the victims of chemical weapons, the medical staff who treated them, and the eyewitnesses. The FFM teams interviewed them, collect biomedical and environmental samples, and drew conclusions as a, as a result of meticulous uh, scientific examinations. The FFM investigated 74 allegations and established the likely use of chemical weapons in 20 instances. The FFM mandate was limited to determine the use and did not get into attribution. I believe that the uh, FFM had some deterring effect on the users and the situation could have been much worse if this mechanism was not established. The task of identification of perpetrators was later given by the UN Security Council to the OPSWN Joint Investigative Mechanism, Jimmy in short, in August 2015. Russia voted in favor of this resolution. This came as a surprise to many of us, including Syrians. However, the Russian position radically changed a few months later after it became militarily involved in Syria. Jim submitted its reports to the U.S. Security Council and shared them with the OPSW. The reports established that the Syrian Armed Forces was responsible for the use of chemical weapons in three cases and ISIL in one case. The OPSW Executive Council took a decision to introduce new inspections at, uh, <clears throat> at the Scientific Research Center near Damascus. Russia raised doubts about the findings of the FFM and Jim. They developed some narratives about incidents, particularly staging scenarios, sometimes contradicting each other. They questioned the impartiality and objectivity of the OPSW staff. They lobbied with other member states to gain support. <clears throat> the proceedings at the OPSW had become increasingly politicized and polarized and tense. Jim's mandate was not extended by the U.S. Security Council because of the Russian veto at the end of 2017. The FFM continued to work on the determination of the use of chemical weapons, but a gap emerged in, the, in regard to the attribution. Several options, including the UNSG mechanism, were considered. The U.S. Secretary General was reluctant to initiate it. In my public statements, I suggest that the OPSW Secretariat could do the job if the Director General was given a new mandate. The Salisbury incident in March 2018 in the UK triggered a turning point for the OPSW and the CWC regime. <clears throat> this incident showed that more had to be done to deter further use of chemical weapons in Syria and elsewhere. The UK and other Western countries undertook a wide and effective campaign which culminated in the June decision of the special session of the Conference of States Parties. The investigation and identification team IIT was established under the authority of the OPSW Director General. This was a significant milestone in the history of the OPSW. A specialized agency uh, was given uh, such a mandate without a UN uh, resolution, Security Council resolution. The IIT focused on certain incidents for which the FFM had determined that use or likely use of chemical weapons on the territory of the Syrian Arab Republic occurred and for which the gym had not reached a final conclusion. The IIT produced four reports and identified in three of them the Syrian Armed Forces as responsible of use of chemical weapons, including in Duma in April 2018. In its last report published last month, the IIT identified ISIL as responsible of use of mustard gas in September 2015 in Marea. The reports were also sent to the UN Secretary General and uh, the triple IM mechanism uh, established uh, by the UN General Assembly in 2016. The IIT reached its conclusions on the basis of the degree of certainty of reasonable grounds, which is the standard of proof 
consistently adopted by international fact-finding missions. It deployed uh, scientific methods and using a holistic approach, examined all scenarios, including staging hypotheses as claimed by Syria and Russia. It's important to keep in mind that the IIT is not a judicial body with the authority to assign individual criminal responsibility, nor does the IIT have the authority to make final findings of non-compliance with the convention. The mandate of the IIT is to establish the facts related to perpetrators of the use of chemical weapons by identifying all information potentially relevant to the origin of those weapons. In other words, this mechanism facilitates the follow-up actions by the Office of Group Decision-Making Organs, by the United Nations or relevant judicial bodies. As a result of the first IIT report covering these three cases in Latamina in March 2017, the Conference of State Parties decided in its 25th session in April 2021 to suspend some rights and privileges, including voting rights of Syria, until it redressed the situation and fulfilled certain specific obligations. Some Senior Syrian officials had been included on the US and EU sanctions lists. However, no individual had yet been prosecuted. In the absence of an international court, which could be seized for that purpose, national tribunals in Western countries could perhaps prosecute and convict in absentia the Syrian officials who are responsible for the use of chemical weapons. Upholding the credibility and integrity of this Chemical Weapons Convention is the collective responsibility of member countries of the OPSW in order to ensure it, the individuals who are responsible of the use of chemical weapons must be held accountable. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, so let's move now to uh, Fadl Abdul Ghani, head of the Syrian Network for Human Rights. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for, um, for having me and uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, uh, the CWC for organizing this event. My remark will focus on three points. First, the uh, documenting violation linked to the use of chemical weapons. We have a team separate, uh, spread across Syria specialized in monitoring the like uh, regular uh, violation committed since 2011. But I still remember when the regime, the first use of the chemical weapons took place against um, uh, uh, our people in Al Bayada neighborhood in city of Homs on December 23rd, uh, 2012. Um, we were surprised, actually. We don't have that experience um, to uh, document such um, uh, an incident. And I think that uh, faced us again in the second incident. Then uh, we got a specialized training and, and, and began documenting because uh, we thought that the regime might repeated uh, those incidents. Uh, and I think that uh, those minor incidents didn't draw the attention for the international community or the uh, international organization. Uh, uh, the regime actually committed, based on our database, 33 attacks before Al Ghuta attacks in, in uh, August uh, 2013. Uh, so we recorded all of those based on uh, our methodology, uh, like we uh, got, um, uh, we record the timing, location, the weather condition, victims to death or injured, and um, also the type of weapon used. We also reach to eyewitnesses or survival survivors of the um, uh, incident obtain their contact information, as well as massive collection of photos and videos, uh, examining their authenticity. Also, we gathered other evidence as well. Uh, but at certain level, we don't have lab. So we don't like um, analysis, uh, the, the dust or the blood. We don't know the, the type of uh, of the, the chemical. 
uh, that's out of our hand, but we are able to identify that there is a chemical attack uh, uh, took place or or not because those being suffocated or suffered from uh, from something. What's what is that? Uh, so we reflect on our database uh, a large number of of, of report. Um, we published, um, I think, about 51 report. Some actually focus on specific in the, uh, incident. Some of them analysis uh, the uh, attacks, uh, uh, the overall attacks. So, uh, and um, uh, we used to um, advocate uh, an action to be taken uh, so we documented 222 chemical attacks in, in Syria since uh, since uh, Al-Bayada, the attacks I mentioned, the attack I mentioned in uh, on December 23rd. Um, and those are, we distribute those based on, on the year. So two uh, in 2012, 31 on... Uh, uh, 2013, uh, 63, 2014, 70, 2015, and 28, 2016, 21, 2017, 6, 2018, and one on 2019. And uh, we used to also record how many uh, uh, people died, the casualties led the cause of this uh, attack. Attacks, uh, so 1,413 civilians, including 214 children, 262 women. Uh, we recorded that the regime committed 217 attacks and ISIS carried out five chemical uh, attacks. Under actually threats and pressure, the Syrian regime ratified the convention. He will never ratify the convention without uh, pressure and threaten that um, an intervention um, uh, will take place if the regime continue uh, uh, to use the chemical weapons. And that happened after the, the largest chemical attacks in the modern history in uh, Eastern and Western uh, Wuta. This actually would have been considered as a uh, good achievement if if the Syrian regime has stopped using chemical weapons against the Syrian people. But UN and international report, uh, the ambassador referred to uh, the Commission of Inquiry, the GEM, the Joint Mechanism, and the IIT um, proved that the Syrian regime continue and um, uh, of course, our uh, our report, but the standard is different, as I mentioned, uh, that the regime continue uh, using chemical weapons, and uh, and actually, uh, the regime used chemical weapons after the two one one eight, the famous resolution, famous UN Security Council resolution, more than. Uh, the regime used the chemical weapons before the resolution. As I mentioned, 33 attacks and 184 attacks took place after uh, the 27 September 2013. Uh, the second point is the, uh, the obvious responsibility of the Syrian regime and also the regime allies the Russia for the use of chemical weapons. Why we are saying that? Actually, the Syrian regime is, is different than, than the democratic regime. We are talking about a, a, a centralized regime who is like, so those attacks need a many logistic and a many institution to work together. We are not talking about ordinary weapons like um, cannon or tanks or those cannot be carried out without approval and acknowledgement from the head of the state, from Bashar al-Assad himself. That, so the decision is central, and we actually recognize that lots of security apparatus are involved mainly 
by leadership uh, the, of the general military intelligence division, the leader of air force intelligence Div division and the national security office in addition to the center for scientific study and research, mainly institution 1000 and branch 450. And our database indicate the involvement of at least 387 individuals. We have their name, ranks, and all of that. Also, we recorded to our uh, database that Russia in, has provided direct military support to the Syrian regime in at least three chemical attacks. In Khan Sheikhoun, April uh, 2017, Saraqib, February 8, 2018, Duma, April 7, 20. 18 and um, actually the IIT uh, second and third report mentioned Russia involvement in supporting uh, uh, the regime. In addition to that, Russia used the veto weapons to the regime uh, uh, to, to continue and that support the regime to continue uh, its crime. Three vetoes, um, it's ended the mandate of the join in international investigation mechanism which has the authority to identify the perpetrator of chemical attacks and uh, thanks to ambassador here i i will jump in i will not hi highlight that because he did but the the russia end this mechanism and by veto the security council transferred to be an obstacles front of the justice and accountability transfer, unfortunately, and, and lose the credibility. Due to the end of the gym, the RPCW expand their mission and they establish the IIT. And they have the ability now to, uh, in, in January uh, uh, 2023, and they have the ability now to identify the perpetrator because uh, the FFM, the fact-finding mission, they only said that chemical weapons being used or not, which is, doesn't mean uh, that much to the victims. The, the victims need to naming and shaming the perpetrator themselves. And that's, that's the, the, the core of the accountability. The final point, and I will leave a little bit the recommendation and what we can do maybe to the question, but the final point is the cooperation between the civil society and I can, as executive director uh, for the Syrian Network for Human Rights, highlight our efforts with the UN and the OPCW. Actually, we, since our establishment in 20, 2011, we, has a, a, a strong cooperation with the Commission of Inquiry. And we continuously share data with um, uh, the OHCHR, including uh, the chemical weapons incident. We also share data of victims of uh, the chemical weapons uh, for the High Commissioner. Uh, they used to uh, do analysis about the casualties in, in Syria and the SNHR is the main source. Also, we sign a memorandum uh, of understanding MOU with the investigation and identification team uh, at the OBCW. And we have been a, a, a primary source uh, in all of their report. And uh, we are proud of the outcome and the intensive effort of the IIT uh, team Recently, they uh, published a report uh, about the use of chemical weapons in Maria, but the major report was about the Duma attack uh, uh, and the involvement of, uh, uh, of Russia. And for sure, uh, we are assuring our continuous support for the mandate of the IIT and their ongoing and the future uh, investigation and uh, as um, as well. Uh, and here I will end it. And uh, I'm looking forward to what can be done and some recommendation. Thank you for listening.
Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, and then finally, let's um, move to Ambassador Susanna Gordon. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Kia ora koutou, nā mihi nui kia koutou. Greetings to everybody. I'm Susanna Gordon. I'm the New Zealand ambassador to the OPCW. I'm based here in The Hague in the Netherlands. Um, it's a great pleasure to speak here today about the role of states parties in ensuring compliance with the Chemical Weapons Convention. And, and I think to start off with, it's worth talking about my own country. Uh, we're a strong advocate for disarmament, um, for abolition of weapons of mass destruction. We would generally say it's one of our signature foreign policy areas that we focus on. Anyone who follows the nuclear debate will see New Zealand loud and vocal on all of the issues uh, from the Non-Proliferation Treaty, nuclear-free zones, uh, all of it. Uh, we even took uh, France to the International Court of Justice over nuclear testing. So we've been strong and active on it. And we do this because it aligns with our values. Um, these weapons, chemical weapons, and all the weapons of mass destruction are immoral and inhumane. But it's also in our interests because uh, without these weapons, the world is safer and we're all safer. And although my country is a long way from anywhere, you can see pictures behind me of Auraki, our largest mountain, very safe and peaceful country. Nevertheless, we're part of the world and we need the world to be safer and more peaceful for everybody. So as a state party, we, uh, we, we joined the Chemical Weapons Convention. We're an active member. We, we come on to the Executive Council this year in May for two years. But even when we're an observer, we are always making statements and having our voice heard. In the last council in March, for example, we did three statements, uh, usually in groups. This, this is with uh, Canada and Australia quite often. And uh, we were talking about non-compliance in Syria, the, the subject of the two previous speakers. Uh, we talked about Ukraine. We made a statement about the poisoning of Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny with a chemical weapon. So we are active in trying to make sure that we uphold the convention. Um, the two previous speakers have talked about Syria, and I, um, it, it's a subject that New Zealand has also said a lot about. But I was today I wanted to talk a bit about what's happening in Ukraine. It's another situation, and it's another area where upholding the convention is coming into clear focus. In particular, in the war in Ukraine, what we're seeing is the use of riot control agents as a method of warfare. Now, this is absolutely prohibited under the Convention, Article 1.5. You may not use riot control agents as a method of warfare. And what we're seeing is media reporting from Russian media showing commanders actively talking about how they are using riot control agents, uh, CN or CS tear gas, dropping it into dugouts to smoke out, they're using that word, Ukrainian forces. There's been media reporting of riot control agents being dropped from um, uh, manned aerial ve vehicles. They're being dropped into the trenches, gas being dispelled from K-51 grenades. This is on our Russian media first channel discussing how their units are using the riot control agents as a method of warfare in the uh, Donetsk Oblast region. So it, there's a lot of it, of this reporting, and Ukraine has reported it as well in a statement to the Executive Council. They said that they have recorded 346 individual to toxic chemical incidents in this year alone, in 2024. Right control agents are a bit tricky, though, you, you know, because they do have a legitimate civilian use. I mean, I, I myself once got a face full of tear gas when I was in the wrong place when... I was in France and the French police were stopping a, a protest uh, where people were setting fire to things. And, you know, they're, they're for use in open air and open spaces to dispel crowds. And they do have a legitimate use, but they're not to be used as a method of warfare. And lethality of riot control agents climbs when you use them in, in enclosed spaces, especially if you're using them to smoke out forces and especially if you combine them with other tactics like you're smoking out people out of enclosed spaces and then you target them with artillery so we're worried about it and you know russia is a state party to the chemical weapons convention it's bound by the convention and by its legislation and you can't it can't be doing this so a lot of 
uh, states have voiced their concern um, about potential breaches of the Chemical Weapons Convention, and they are starting to look at what can be done under Article 9 of the Convention, which is where you ensure compliance. I mean, a couple of caveats. Uh, I talked about riot control agents being a legitimate uh, use for civilian purposes, so that's not always crystal clear. Also, the definition of method of warfare in the Convention, it's not always crystal clear what that means. It's complex terminology. And not all riot control agents, you know, are covered. There's other areas of international law, humanitarian law that come into it. There's the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, which covers different chemicals to the Chemical Weapons Convention. So all of these treaties have their own obligations for conduct about weapons and warfare. So what can we states parties do? Well, first of all, Article 9 of the Convention says states can request the Executive Council to assist in clarifying any situation which may be considered ambiguous or which gives rise to a concern about the possible non-compliance of another state party with this convention. So we've seen that for the first time, Germany has raised an Article 9.3 intervention. Uh, Russia responded and said, we don't know what you're talking about. We don't know the basis for this concern. Germany has gone back and said, we don't consider the Russian answer adequate. So there's been a back and forth about it. And we're really keen to see how it's evolving. And we are following it very closely. What could be done? Well, I mean, we've heard about the models for the um, IIT and the fact-finding missions that were used in Syria. We, we will have to think about that in due course, about how we investigate, identify, and assign accountability. I mean, you also have political avenues. You can lobby, you can form coalitions, you can collectively get together to push for accountability with other states' parties, with civil society. And there's ways that states parties can help practical support, uh, preserving evidence chains, uh, helping draft legislation where possible. So those are the kind of things that states parties can do. And, and I guess I would finish up with perhaps a final point, which is that if you're wanting to ensure compliance with the Chemical Weapons Convention, then everybody who's a party to it needs implementing legislation and we are working on that. Some of the smaller states in our region struggle a bit to, to get it all done. Um, so we're working with them to try and help get that legislation drafted. And also, you know, the convention needs to be universal. There are four states that are outside the convention at the moment. Um, South Sudan has indicated that it is going to exceed, which is wonderful news. But we still have Israel, Egypt, and DPRK, North Korea. And we would like to see this be a convention that every single country in the world belongs to. So, so universalization is another way to uphold the convention. So thank you so much. And it's been a, it's a great pleasure to talk about this and how we can work as states to make sure that the convention that we hold dear, that is key to our values and our interests, how we can make sure that it is upheld and that there's compliance when, when states are in breach. Thank you. Thank you to all three of our panelists. These were both all really, really fascinating and insightful presentations. We already got a few questions just asking like, will you share the presentations? Um, so people definitely have an interest in going back and listening to it again. So that's always a good sign. Um, I think, so we have about 20 minutes or so um, for questions, which we've been getting some Really good questions from the audience. Um, I think to start, let's stay on the topic of Russia because we had received a few questions um, about, about that. Um, so this was a question for Ambassador Uzumchu. Um, Ambassador Gordon um, kind of addressed it a bit as well, but um, the question is asking, what in your view should member states do next to redress Russian non-compliance? Um, so maybe we can, yeah, can I build off of these kind of recommendations or um, just for the perspective from Ambassador Ozumchu first, and then we'll go from there. 
Uh, thank, thank you. Uh, Ambassador Gordon already mentioned, I think, uh, what could be the option to, uh, options to pursue the matter. Article 9 <laughs> was activated by Germany and uh, a few other uh, member states, uh, uh, and uh, questions were raised. Uh, Russia uh, apparently uh, asked, uh, you know, counter questions, uh, what would be, what were the grounds for such questions and so on, without really getting into substance of the matter. Uh, so uh, another option, as mentioned again, it could be the, uh, you know, the activation of the IIT mechanism, um, because our, uh, paragraph 20 of the uh, June 2018 decision by the CSP uh, allows, in fact, the member states uh, to uh, seek uh, technical assistance from the OPCW uh, to uh, when they get into investigations of uh, alleged use of chemical weapons. So, uh, therefore, uh, Ukraine, uh, in fact, could approach the OPCW Secretariat uh, and uh, uh, ask for technical assistance if they want to investigate the uh, uh, this, this, uh, you know, uh, the allegations of use of right control agents um, <clears throat> in uh, during the war uh, over there, uh, as it was said, actually, it's um, uh, it would be a violation of the Chemical Weapons Convention. It's uh, strictly uh, prohibited, uh, uh, you know, to use them uh, as a method of warfare. So that's uh, something that that could certainly be done. Uh, if I can jump in. Yes, go ahead. I think that um, in addition to what uh, uh, Ambassador said, um, the Syrian regime has violated the Chemical Weapon Convention, convention in a well-documented uh, uh, way in, at, at, to the highest standard. We are talking about the, the, the lab of the OPCW, which is they have the the best lab in all around the world and the the very strict methodology also the report of the gym was incredible amazing methodology and i like uh, reviewed all of them in in um, in depth uh, so based on that based on the iit report and the gym report and the commission of inquiry here i'm talking about the un and the OBCW. Of course, there is an international organization document that, and there is Syrian Network for Human Rights as a national organization as well. Based on all of that, I think New Zealand and other countries can take action based on the regime violation of the convention and move to build a file and the case before the International Court of Justice, similar to now, here in Netherlands and, and the Canadian, they moved against the Syrian regime because the, the regime violated the uh, 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 convention, the, the torture convention. And I think this case can be linked to Russia as well because of their involvement. The IIT mentioned that clearly, in especially in the Duma uh, report, and they named Russia as a state party and their complicit with, with the Syrian regime is obvious. Uh, so I think this case, um, this uh, this a major movement, uh, and uh, something cannot, something didn't happen till now. So we are feeling that there is um, like lack of uh, accountability on the chemical file. Also, um, something less can be done uh, at least those individuals whose involvement in uh, the chemical file who's been proved we don't want like to accuse someone who is innocent but based on for sure a solid ground and methodology we accused those 387 individual i think those at least should be uh, uh, put on uh, should be placed on the uh, all of the state uh, sanction list uh, and uh, f f finally, uh, any restore relation with regime or government use the massive destruction. We're talking chemical weapons is massive destruction. So this link with this such a regime or 
government should be con condemned. So cut political or economic or any types of of relations should be actually uh, mandatory and any reconnection should be condemned. And we need to hear that from, from the state. Um, and, and the Syrian people cannot accept government or regime use chemical weapons and kill their brother or sister or so uh, the international community has responsibility based on the uh, the article 1 geneva convention that not to respect only the the law but to ensure respect and that obvious this this um, case uh, is uh, 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 caring about and this is the the spirit of the human rights it's caring all the humanity and and we we need to be together to fight uh, in, immunity uh, so the only way actually is to push forward the political transition uh, in syria uh, and i think that will end this uh, oval uh, fight thank you thank you Okay, um, we have, let's see, um, if so we've had a few questions about this, so I think we should address. Um, there were a few different people asking um, if uh, there have been any indications that Syria continues to maintain and use chemical weapons today, um, either for um, Ambassador Zumchu or um, Mr. Abdul Ghani, whoever would like to answer just uh, briefly, is it still... Is this yeah. something we should be aware of? Yeah. We we do have evidence that the Syrian regime didn't handle all of his stock. Uh, the regime actually manipulated and cheated the uh the uh, the OBCW and uh, uh and uh, and they 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 actually mentioned that clearly uh that uh, the regime didn't cooperate at all. Um, what does that mean? And they keep revealing that the, the, there is some factors here or some stock here that didn't, uh, de didn't deliver. And um, I think we have indication that the regime is uh, they didn't handle all of his uh, chemical weapons and the stop, uh, stop coordinating with them. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I, and there is a lot of statement from the OBCW themselves that the regime didn't uh, cooperate, stop cooperation, prevent them to uh, visit f freely um, all areas. So that uh, means that the regime is hiding something actually, and they didn't transparency at all. And they that being mentioned at um, at the state conference. Thank you. Um, let's uh, go back to to Russia briefly. Question for Ambassador Gordon, and then we'll do one more question at the end. Um, what um, might be the next steps in proving that Russians uh, Russia has been using riot control agents in its war with Ukraine? And um, is there consideration of invoking Article Nine? Um, in including a request to establish a group of experts to examine the case as far as you're aware? Yeah, I think that there is quite a bit of discussion about Article 9 and Germany's request to Russia to uh, please explain what's going on was done under Article 9. So it's it's already started. Um, and there's, yeah, there's all of those options exist uh, going forward. Um, Ukraine has also indicated that it will uh, agree a privileges and immunities agreement with the OPCW, which would allow the OPCW teams to go to Ukraine. And um, that would also help them work with Ukrainian authorities to preserve evidence. So, so that's another important thing that has to happen too. The Ukrainians have to do their piece of the, of the legal uh, um, work too. Um, and we have seen that this can move quite fast at times when it, it when it needs to. Um, but, you know, Ukraine's under attack. It's fighting a war. So it's not necessarily easy for all the different pieces of the legal puzzle to be put in place. But going back to the Syria point uh, just made now, um, Syria signed the treaty in 2013 and it's still got 17 uh, outstanding areas where it, it's not 
its initial declaration that you, you make when you sign the treaty is not complete or accurate and every you know the, everybody can see this and so yes we do need to keep the pressure on Syria like you have to be full and complete in your initial declaration you can't just leave things out so it, it is important to keep the pressure up uh, across the board but hopefully we will see some um, some forward movement on uh, on actions to really look at what's going on in Ukraine because it's a, it's an important situation as well. Okay, and we just have a few minutes left. So in the last uh, last bit um, for our final question, um, I let's see, um, this is open to to whoever would like to answer. Um, what should the OPCW do for humanitarian support for victims of chemical weapons attacks? Um, I think that I can jump in again. Uh, I think that the OBCW need to uh, uh, move ahead and to hold the uh, Security Council more uh, uh, responsibility. Uh, uh, the Security Council failed and um, I think it can be request that the General Assembly here move ahead and issue a, a resolution contain uh, uh, redressing, acknowledgement of, of, of those victims, redress the, the victims, uh, especially that uh, there is no any near hope or future for, for those victims. What is what we faced actually? I think some the OBCW need to clearly mention uh, publicly. Sometimes they are conservative. Uh, I don't know why. They need to um, request publicly from the state, uh, at least, and that's the minimum bar, uh, to pressure the state to cooperate with them by preserving those victims, protecting the witness. We are facing... Duma attack, the whole world watched the, the play made by Russia, brought some um, survivors under, uh, under threats and uh, what they did here in The Hague. It was like disaster. We didn't hear any comment from the OBCW. I think they need to request from, st from the state to adopt some of those survival to give them asylum. We are, lo we are losing contact with them because they are displaced inside Syria for many times. So at that at least they can offer to the witnesses, to, the, uh, to those who is like willing to uh, endanger themselves for the sake of accountability and to uh, like uh, uh, reveal what they, what they face. That's something the OPCW can play more uh, role uh, and take further step in that and um, and address this issue and other issues uh, to the uh, General Assembly. I'm going to jump in here and say that I think that the OPCW needs to keep, um, you, you know, it, it, its purpose and mandate have to be kept in mind. It's not a court. And it can't be that. And it's not a humanitarian agency. And there are other agencies in the UN system that are um, better placed to do that. Um, as for asylum and uh, that kind of stuff, that would rest with the state's parties rather than with the organisation. But um, I think that it is important to say what the OPCW is doing. For example, some really useful technical assistance around the world on training first responders so that at least the victims of chemical attacks will be able to be assisted by people who know how to handle that and don't inadvertently make it worse. Some chemical attacks have very specific natures, you know, um, some, some gases actually rise. And so when people are leaving basements, they're actually going up into the gas rather than um, staying down low where they would escape it. So there's some very specific factors that are 
related to chemical weapons and the OPCW has a really good practical role in training first responders. So I think that that kind of thing is something that we all really support. And the, the organization's got its new fantastic Chemtech Centre, the Centre for Chemistry and Technology, and it's really delivering some great programs in that space, which we're all really proud of. Uh, if I may, Mina, uh, you know, just uh, to, to, to spoil a few other comments, uh, actually, uh, let's not forget that the OPSW is a technical organization and uh, the secretary of the uh, organization is called technical secretariat, which means that the, the work which is being done uh, by, by, by them uh, is purely technical. And uh, the mechanisms that were established be it the FFM or uh, the IIT are, uh, in fact, uh, providing some, <clears throat> uh, you know, reports uh, based on scientific and technical uh, methods. Uh, as to the politics, uh, which would, uh, you know, follow them, up, it's up to the member states to, to follow them, uh, or the United Nations, UN Security Council, and so on. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, I, I, I think uh, it would be rather unfair to expect the Director General or the Office of Secretariat, in fact, to uh, stand up and to get into uh, politics uh, which are related to be it to the events in Syria or uh, in, 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 in Ukraine. Uh, as Ambassador Gordon said, actually, uh, the... the uh, OPSW has uh, significantly enhanced its technical capabilities over the uh, past years uh, by building this chem tech center. This uh, initiative actually I, uh, I took in 2018 uh, and I'm very pleased to see that it's now uh, uh, you know, uh, accomplished uh, with the support of uh, a large number of states parties. And uh, I, I saw the pictures of them, and, and uh, I'm told that uh, the, the center is functioning uh, very effectively by providing training, uh, uh, you know, to, to experts coming from member states and so on. Uh, uh, but uh, again, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the the deficiencies, uh, you know, uh, gaps in costs in the. Syrian declaration that were mentioned by Fadel uh, are uh, is correct, and uh, Ambassador Gordon mentioned uh, that there are outstanding seventeen outstanding issues. I I read the reports of the that uh, you know based on their consultations in October last year and uh, in January this year. I understand three issues outstanding issues were resolved, but uh, uh, there are still seventeen others, uh, and uh, it's obvious that uh, you know looking at the uh, use of chemical weapons by the Syrian armed forces that uh, several, uh, you know, uh, chemical uh, uh, capabilities, chemical weapon capabilities were not declared by the Syrian government uh, uh, in their original declaration and uh, later on, about, uh, you know, some uh, during the additional uh, declarations. Uh, therefore, all these issues must be uh, addressed and they are being addressed by uh, by existing uh, mechanisms, but uh, uh, so it, it's taking time, and uh, it's unfortunate that uh, there have been several victims, uh, you know, uh, civilians, uh, uh, which are were subject to chemical attacks in uh, in Syria, and uh, as I said uh, in my introductory remarks, uh, accountability is uh, important, is essential, and uh, those who are responsible. Uh, should certainly be held um, accountable. Thank you. Okay. All right, so it looks like we are out of time. Um, we had so many more questions that um, we just didn't get a chance to get to, but all really um, important things to address at, uh, at some point. But um, I think that already this was a really insightful and informative discussion. Um, I will be posting it on all of the CWC Coalition um, social media and website um, in the next, within a week or so. Um, and I encourage anybody who has any questions or wants to, to follow up with the CWC Coalition, um, you can just email me at 
mrose at armscontrol.org, which I can put in the chat for everyone. Um, but um, I just would like to, to thank again our panelists um, for dedicating some of their time, uh, taking time out of their busy schedules to join us and to um, share all of this, um, their, their insights and all of this information with us. Um, in terms of compliance, this is really the, these are just two specific cases. It's um, kind of the tip of the iceberg. Um, and the CWC coalition is going to continue to address um, all issues relevant to the CWC and um, what's going on at the OPCW. So um, again, thank you to everybody who, who joined us and everyone who participated. Um, we really, really appreciate um, all of your attention. So thank you and have a great day.